Hello, everyone. Today on the final bar, I'll be presenting you with my second half of the year outlook as part of our week long festivities, charting the second half here on Stock Charts TV. The SP continuing to push higher after Friday's rally, pushing into uh, uh, to the upside with renewed strength today, more of the same in a heavy earnings week. A lot of uh, financials reporting, a number of other stocks as well, and staples in some other sectors. We're going to think about the relationship of earnings and the markets going forward. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we look at the markets together using the power of stock charts, using data visualization to visually represent investor psychology and decision making. I have learned over my career the markets are driven by fear of uh, investors. It's the emotional state motivating, motivating buy and sell decisions. On the upside, it's fear of missing out, the FOMO. On the downside, it's fear of losing everything. And fear is really uh, palpable as you see volatility increased and you see the market continuing to push higher. There's definitely a fear of missing out on things, uh, you know, moving to new all-time highs. Uh, you know, when you have this sort of configuration with the market in a, in a bull market phase that's making new highs, it's all about trend following mode. And, and uh, I will tell you in my second half of the year outlook, sort of what sort of things I'll be looking at, what sort of guideposts I will use to track the market activity. But at the end of the day, I'm a trend follower, as I hope many of you are thinking about momentum, thinking about wh what's working and what isn't. And I'll tell you what's working is its equities and its growth. And, uh, and we'll look at a lot of charts to sort of indicate that overall strength. Now, we have great guests on the show. Super excited last week with some really Interesting conversations about the uh, the big picture and how it's evolving. This week on the final bar, on Tuesday the 13th, we have Larry Tentarelli from Blue Chip Daily. On Wednesday the 14th, Willie Delwich from uh, All Star Charts. Then on Thursday, Christopher Mullen from the Technical Traders joining us again. As I mentioned earlier, all this week is charting the second half. This is our special mid-year market outlook discussion. All week, we have special guests, people like Linda Rashke, Gina Martin-Adams, Tony Dwyer, Martin Pring, Many, many others. We have a panel uh, during the week with uh, with people sharing their outlook. Today on the show, as part of that charting the second half, I'll be kicking off on my show by sharing my uh, second half outlook as uh, as part of our broadcast. I'd encourage you to go to our website, stockcharts.com slash charting the two and the half. You'll see all the, uh, the schedule of events and all the great speakers and content for you. Also, just to let you know, I'll be doing my next webcast as part of my own uh, market misbehavior effort. Uh, we'll be discussing what I call the market top checklist. When the market's in this sort of phase, I think it's all about what checklist, what uh, list of items you follow to anticipate when the, the top is in and how you actually uh, anticipate that and how you deal with that once those signals are triggered. I'll share with you what my market top checklist look like and how to think about it going forward as we're in the seasonally weakest part of the year. If you're interested, go to marketmisbehavior.com slash market top for more information on that free event. Let's continue on with uh, our uh, market recap. So what we'll do today, a little different than our normal Monday. Usually we hit the market from three directions, Mark, uh, you know, the overall asset allocation view, then sectors, and then stocks, and then we wrap the show. Today we're going to do something a little different because of the charting the second half uh, special event this week. So we'll do a market recap here, just touching on some of the key themes from today and what we're seeing here on a Monday and going into this week. And then we're we'll going to transition right into our uh, charting the second half discussion. I'll share with you uh, I think seven or eight charts that I laid out that I think tell the story uh, of what things you should be following uh, going forward. So on our market recap today, essentially the market continuing to push to new highs, new closing highs today with the S&P closing just below 43.85. It's about a third of a percent higher than it was on Friday. And really, if you look at the chart of the S&P, just continuing to make higher highs uh, every week, often making higher closes every week. So far this week is continuing the trajectory that we had on uh, on Friday with really renewed strength going into the close. Same thing, you have an acceleration out of the open, acceleration into the close overall, and it's a, it's very much a uh, a healthy bull market phase based purely on the analysis of price. 
Uh, growthy stuff uh, lagging a little bit. It was financials that led the way today. And that's interesting because a lot of the banks are reporting uh, earnings this week. Tomorrow morning, you have JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs before the open on Tuesday. Wednesday, Bank of America, Citigroup, BlackRock, Morgan Stanley, U.S. Bank were on Friday. Some of the asset managers like Schwab and uh, State Street on Friday. So every week you, or every day this week, you have uh, other uh, sort of large financial institutions reporting. And I think this could be a pivotal week for sort of that growth versus value trade. Value is what led us in many ways to where we're at. Growth has sort of taken over with the FANG stocks making new uh, new highs and you know almost all of them sort of rotating uh, back to the upside, save Netflix, which is lagging a little bit, but overall uh, all in decent shape. This could be the week where some of the financial stocks get a renewed uh, you know, boost a, a signal of a uh, potential further upside. This could be the catalyst to reignite that value trade that's sort of been dormant for a little while. And today, so far, uh, or, or today's uh, so far this week now, indicating some uh, renewed interest in sort of the value oriented spaces. So interesting to see technology actually flat for the day using the X. Okay, the Nasdaq 100 was up about a third of a percent, the VIX uh, hovering around 16.2. Other asset classes very quickly. Interest rates are actually fluctuating quite a bit today. The TLT actually ended the day down about 0.1%. Ten-year yields up around 136, but that was chopping quite around uh, around that uh, sort of midpoint, sort of the midpoint of where it was for the day. And the dollar up just a little amount. Gold, an interesting uh, day. You actually had a sell-off out of the open on the GLD, but rallied very quickly and recovered it. Spent most of the day sort of just below the zero line and silver prices a little higher. Energy overall was weaker today on, uh, on weaker oil prices. Cryptocurrencies continuing to feel the pain. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you quite honestly, I don't have cryptocurrencies as part of my uh, you know, part of my uh, set of charts to watch. I certainly could have. I, I didn't have an unlimited number of uh, charts to want to talk about, but we can start with the chart of uh, of Bitcoin. You know, as I've mentioned uh, many times in recent days, recent weeks, and even in recent months, I, I see cryptocurrencies, broadly speaking, as an asset class in distribution mode. You know, when, when you look at this chart, and if I would ask my five-year-old son, is this going up or down? If he if he had the basic concepts of chart reading, he would certainly, you know, agree that this is in distribution mode. This is going, uh, this is transitioned. If you go from last year through mid-April, this is clearly a chart in accumulation mode, a chart making higher highs and higher lows above upward sloping moving averages. That has now completely changed. You have a chart that's broken down, making lower lows and lower highs. It's undercutting key moving averages. The only final thing that has uh, that has saved the chart of Bitcoin is that it stopped going lower overall, right? You've hit this floor around 30,000. We've tested that five or six different times now, maybe even more uh, so far year to date, every one of those times we've bounced up. And so, you know, a level like that, a key level of support, you have to trust that that's in play until proven otherwise. So the real trigger here, I think, would be a break below 30,000. I think you will have a lot of investors that are sort of holding on here, speculating that we've had a, a short-term bottom in place, uh, speculating on recovery and returning back more towards uh, the previous highs uh, from the first quarter. If you get a signal that that's not happening, particularly a close below 30,000, I think there could be a flood to the exits that would fuel that next sort of systemic decline, that next real push to the uh, to the downside. So that is really the level to, uh, to watch. But again, looking at the trend, the trend is clearly lower. I think one of the most telling indications of the negative trend is the momentum. Every time that Bitcoin has rallied and made a subsequent peak, number one, it's been lower than the last one. And more importantly, the momentum has been lower. The momentum continues to make lower highs, you know, even as it's below uh, the 50 line. I mean, it's really a negative uh, RSI configuration where you're becoming oversold on a sell-off. The RSI is not getting above 60 on the rallies, uh, which was most recently there in mid-June. So overall, I see that in distribution mode. I don't see that changing uh, today, and I don't see that changing until proven otherwise. A higher low, a change in that momentum structure would certainly or could certainly uh, indicate a bit of a, a bit of a reversal there. Let's look very quickly at some of the other uh, charts here, just wrapping up uh, today's trading, and then we're going to transition into our second half of the uh, of the year uh, outlook. The, the last thing I just wanted to hit on in terms of sectors, financials, as I mentioned, number two, number one, real estate, number two, and I and I think this has been really noteworthy. There have been times when utilities in real estate, even on up days or down days, have been surprising where they've been in the returns for the uh, for the day. So keep in mind, I think it's very easy to uh, you know assume the market's making new highs. That means growth is working. That means defensives are lagging. Whatever you would use to to sort of uh, you know sort of mentally group 
what's working and what's not based on the fact that the market's higher. Today is a perfect reminder that when the market's going higher, you may expect technology to clearly be leading. It wasn't. You might expect something like utilities or real estate, which are fairly defensive, to be at the bottom of the list. They weren't. They were more toward the top of the list. So I would encourage you, as always, to focus on the trend, focus on the charts, uh, focus on what's working and what isn't. Don't pay as much attention about what should be leading or lagging based on the market conditions. Focus on the message of the markets themselves. And I think, you know, if there's one, uh, you know, one keyword I would use uh, to describe the market so far here in recent months, and I think going forward is going to be confusion was one I was thinking of. Indigestion is another one. Uh, rotational is the word I was going to settle in on. It's basically a, a, a leadership rotation that's still very fluid. And I would pay attention to the uh, to the short term fluctuations. That's our market recap for today. Again, focusing on some of the on the S&P making new highs, uh, financials leading the way up. Let's continue on now uh, through the bulk of our show, which is going to be really the charting the second half discussion. Let's focus on what's happened so far, but really looking forward and thinking about the second half of the year. Coming out of the 4th of July holiday, the question was, you know, we had a bit of a, of a nice rally going into that, uh, into that long weekend. And the question was, what happens next, right? Uh, we're in the seasonally weakest part of the year, uh, which is sort of July, August, September. Usually, uh, you know, major bottoms will come in that end of the third, beginning of the fourth quarter, September, October, and then the, the, the end of the year tends to be a little stronger than, uh, than that. So the question is, what happens uh, after, uh, you know, in this current market environment, where the real difference is the, the overextended conditions, I, I would argue, we've had in the first six months of the year. I laid out a series of charts that I think tell the story of the market environment. We're going to start on the left, I think there's about eight of them to go through. I'm going to take some time on each one of them and just explain a little bit more. And, and I found on this show, it's very easy to just whip around tons of charts. I'm going to try not to do that in this segment and just focus on the key messages here. So when I think about 2021, and this is something when I was, uh, I think it was Tom Boley uh, asked to ask me to do a, a market outlook at the beginning of the year. This was either in, I think it was the, right at the beginning of the year in January. And this was one of the charts that we uh, looked at together. And, and basically, I, I said that 2021, I think, has a lot of potential similarities to 2010. And I've highlighted the 2009 and 2010 period uh, here on the monthly S&P chart. On the right side, you can see those same uh, to a uh, highlighted sort of comparing the two. And the reason why I thought the comparison was so, uh, so, so appropriate was because look at 2009 and 2020. Now, the, the conditions leading into those years, granted, very, very different, right? So, you know, in 2009, you had just come off of the 2007 high where the S&P was retesting the 2000 high. We rolled over. This is still within the secular bear market of the 2000s. And in 2007, it felt like that secular bear market may be over and we might just be continuing on. Then, of course, we had the financial crisis, et cetera, et cetera. The market ended up bottoming out in the first quarter of 2009. It was that V recovery, which was incredibly um, you know, surprising to many investors, and, and rightfully so. You know, Things led on the way down and then very quickly led on the way out. Financials in particular, I remember just ripping out of these, uh, out of these lows. And it felt it felt kind of crazy that that would be the leadership coming right out of that uh, that low state. the The end of two thousand nine was fairly strong, and most months we finished uh, we closed higher. Two thousand ten was a very different year, right? It was more of a consolidation year, more of a digestion year. Sort of like two thousand nine was the big meal, the big rally coming out of the lows. You had to kind of process that, which would allow you to set the stage to the multi year bull market, which arguably we're still sort of uh, riding out here. 2020, if you look, very similar sort of conditions, right? The bottom in the first quarter. Now, again, the conditions leading into that, very different. That's absolutely right. But in terms of the year, right, you had 2020 bottom in the first quarter, a V bottom, which should not have surprised us too much if we remember 2009, which is very similar. Although not everything had the V bottom in 2009. A lot of things sort of took a little bit more time. But, you know, in, the, in 2020, everything sort of uh, came out of those lows very quickly. And you can see the resilience in, uh, in the equity market uh, pushing out and closing to new all-time highs at the end of the year. Now, I, you know, again, I'm, the comparison that I made that I still overall I think is a good one is 2021 to 2010. 2010 was very choppy. You actually made a low for the uh, on a monthly basis in the second quarter before rallying in the second half of the year. We have not seen that. We've seen a bis, bit of a disconnection between the two years in terms of the lack of, uh, of legitimate pullbacks. The deepest pullback we've had so far, which we'll get to here in a, in a minute, is about 6% or so, I think, off the highs uh, to where we uh, to where we bottomed out there. So that's you know that's 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 a decent pullback, but it's not a climactic. You know every you know it feels like there's real 
profit taking happening. That's more of a viable dip sort of uh, sort of maneuver. What I would say is that the chart of the S&P is a bit misleading in terms of the rotational environment we have. If we look at the first quarter of 2021 and the second quarter of 2021, I would argue they've been uh, they've been very different. The first quarter was about resilience. It was about strength. It was about the market pushing to new highs. The second quarter has been more about divergences. It's been about leadership rotation and some of the cyclical sectors really struggling. Um, so things that led in the first quarter very much changed. This has still been a question mark. You know, if you ask people what's, you know, if, if the market goes higher, what's sort of leading right now? It's hard to really have, I mean, you can you can guess on, on which one, but it's hard to really come up with a clear thesis because there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of fluctuation. I and mean, there's a, there's a there, there there's a case to be made for the fangs to uh, to lead the way higher through year end. There's the case for cyclicals to recover and uh, and sort of lead the way higher uh, as well. And, and and so I think there's not as clear of a picture and that tells you the rotation. So while the S&P has made higher highs, what's happening underneath the hood is much more of a rotational year. So why I, I see 2010 as directionally rotational, if that's a thing, I think 2021 directionally has been positive, but the leadership picture has changed uh, dramatically. So it's interesting, we've actually had rotation without the real, you know, the stalling in the market that we've seen in previous years. So chart number one is that, and really thinking about the uh, you know could we have enough of a pullback here going into the uh, into the third quarter now that would be similar enough to what we saw in 2010 we had a pretty good pull back into the lows in the second quarter we really didn't get that this time is it just delayed a little bit and we get a third third quarter uh, pullback we're going to get to the seasonal trends by the way in just a minute one more chart and then we need to take a quick commercial break and this is the chart of the 10 year yield so you know I've often asked you know, what's the chart to pay attention to? And I'm, I'm giving you eight, but if I had to pick one, it would probably be this one. I think the shape of the yield curve, in particular, the 10-year yield has been such a key story. This is the TNX that we're showing in the uh, in the top panel here. We can see rates really improving the second half of last year, the first quarter of this year. Look at the difference from Q1 to Q2 in terms of the shape of the yield curve, in terms of the interest rate trajectory. You see uh, bonds selling off fairly dramatically in the first quarter. We see bonds bottoming out and rates coming down as bonds rally. Some beautiful divergences there at the end of the first quarter. And if you missed them, go back to the chart of the ag or the TLT. Look at how the prices were going lower and you had a clear bullish momentum divergence leading to the next uh, three months, which we've uh, which we've recently ended. So, so far, rates have been in a decline. And what that means is that growth should be underperforming value uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in a condition where, uh, where rates are uh, going higher, right? It should be uh, value outperforming growth, which is what you see here. You see how that's rotate, rotating back lower. This is the IWD divided by the IWF, by the way. So that's value over growth. So this going down is showing you how value stocks are underperforming. The growth stuff is working again in the last six weeks or so. What's interesting, though, you know, I've heard discussion and I've even mentioned it of, you know, in, uh, there was a day last week where you had a bit of a, of a fluctuation and it lined up pretty well with a, you know, a pullback in rates and a sell off in stocks. But overall, look at the trajectory. The S&P has gone higher overall, regardless of the overall direction of interest rates. So as much as we think of rates as a signal of risk on or risk off, it really hasn't been the, the case here. Rates have gone up, rates have gone down. The S&P has pushed higher. It's been more about the, the, the leadership. It's been more about this ratio and what's working, growth or value versus the direction of the market, which overall has con continued to uh, to push higher. So seeing if that becomes disconnected and if rates, you know, going lower or remaining lower is more of a, a sign of peak growth, a sign of economic instability, a sign of, uh, you know, uh, rotating lower for the uh, for the market. Uh, I think this would be the chart to tell you that until then, it still feels very much like a rotational call rates going up or down are telling you about the uh, uh, the leadership story and less about the overall market direction. We need to take a quick commercial break. We'll be back continuing my discussion, charting the second half. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close. A couple of quick housekeeping tips. Number one, we will do another mailbag segment on Tuesday's show, and we would love to answer your questions live on the air. Shoot us an email, thefinalbar at StockCharts.com. We are on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV. We're on YouTube. 
and put a comment below the video that you're watching. We'd love to hear from you. Any questions that come up as you're analyzing your own charts, uh, we're happy to point you in the, uh, in the right direction. Also, as a reminder, go to stockchartstv.com, use your email, set up a free account. You can start watching all of our great content on our website, also on all of your mobile devices. Just search in all the app stores for Stock Charts TV on demand. I want to continue on with our charting the second half a special event today. As a reminder, the whole week is, uh, is a special uh, uh, event dedicated to uh, second half of the year outlook, a mid year market check in and review of, uh, of where things may be headed. As a reminder, go to stockcharts.com slash charting the 2ND half charting the second half, uh, and you can get a full schedule of all the, uh, the guest speakers, all of their uh, great content and ideas to help put you in the right, uh, in the right mindset here. Let's continue on our discussion, looking at a chart of the S&P 500. Chart number three here is a daily chart of the S&P. We review this chart pretty regularly, so I don't want to, uh, you know, to uh, maim it any further. But you know, overall, I, when I'm looking at this chart, thinking about the first half of the year and thinking about the second half, what strikes me about this year is the limited downside, right? The drawdowns, drawdowns have been minimal. On a closing basis, it's maybe been, I don't know, 4%, 3 or 4% probably on, a, on an intraday basis from intraday high to intraday low. The most we've pulled back is about 5.5%. So overall, these have been very light pullbacks. Every time the market has pulled back to the 50-day moving average, we have closed below it maybe one day, and then we've reverted right back to the upside and closed above it. And so, you know, again, that pattern, I think, number one, shows you the resilience of this market. It shows you how even with the leadership rotation, the overall market direction has continued to push higher. And, and again, there, there are a lot of reasons for that, you know, arguably the Fed and what they're doing uh, and, and, and really the process that we would be looking forward to in the second half of the year uh, is, is key, right? The Fed obviously has been very, very supportive of the, uh, of the market, certainly giving every indication that, they, uh, that they're, uh, you know, keeping equity prices elevated uh, with every tool that they can. They've now started to hint and, and talk about talking about uh, you know, starting to change that interest rate policy, I think in the second half of the year, that is going to be one of the main issues for the market to uh, grapple with is how the Fed starts to add language talking about a potential uh, tightening, a potential or just less, uh, you know, a less uh, dovish stance, a more hawkish stance, you know, changing their, their policy a little bit. The first quarter of next year, the first half of next year is when you'd most likely see some actual implementation of things. But I think the second half of the year, that's going to be a, a key a key metric. And, and to be honest with you, I think the limited pullbacks that we've seen have been driven by an expectation that this uptrend is just going to continue and continue. You know, the, the, the key with uptrends is that they continue until they don't, right? The time to look, the time to start to get concerned, to start to get very defensive, in my opinion, would be when the 50-day does not hold. When you start to get closes below the 50-day and you don't just recover like we have every time so far at the beginning of this year. Now, again, we'll be down 5 to 8% from where we uh, from, from the peak, but again, all large losses begin as small losses. If you can recognize a, a steeper decline early in the stages, you still can save things and, uh, and get defensive or rotate into things that are, uh, that are more... Uh, optimal during that pullback sort of phase. So that's uh, certainly a chart to be looking at and just the limited number of, uh, of pullbacks. If you ask me, are we overdue for a decline? Absolutely. Are we overdue for a more of a deeper correction in terms of price and time? Absolutely. Are we seeing signs that uh, some sort of pullback uh, could be coming? Absolutely. We're going to get to the breadth picture here in a little bit, which is one of the other charts that, uh, that I would like to share with you. My next chart is looking at the FANG stocks or what I call the FANMAG stocks, looking at those six uh, key names. And again, you can add a number. You can add things like NVIDIA or others on this chart probably as well. And it's the same story. I think this reversal of the fangs in the last couple months is a key, key story. And I think that's something to watch very, very closely going into the second half of the year. This week, you have a lot of the financials reporting. It'll get to the point where you have a lot of the fang stocks reporting. And I think watching how the market anticipates those releases, what happens afterwards uh, is going to be very, very, uh, very, very important. If you look at what's happened on the chart of the fangs, there's a point not too long ago where it's sort of, you know, we're talking about not the death of fangs, but sort of like the end of their leadership phase. This is the relative strength of the FANG, uh, FANG Plus index versus the S&P. You can see the rally into February. You can see how things changed from mid-February into mid-May when the whole group started to underperform. There were some stocks like Facebook that were able to make new highs during that phase, but the average stock looked a little more like Netflix, right, which is more uh, selling down and, uh, and, and more range-bound. Amazon, more range-bound. It's sort of in a sideways trend, indicating a lack of upside follow-through. That has all changed 
in the last month and a half, two months. You can see Facebook, uh, one of the uh, most of them are at or near new all time highs. The only one that is not is Netflix. And if you take a trend line using these recent swing highs over the last six months, we've just broken above trend line resistance. And I think all eyes on that 560 level or so, which would be the swing highs. Uh, from uh, from there in April, is it able to continue and push up, push above there, similar to what Apple did, right? We had that uh, break of the trend line cont continuing the lows, we then broke above that swing high. That was the indication of the all clear, and now it's testing all time highs once again. I think the strength in these charts, the ability of these charts to remain strong, uh, is is key. As my guest Mark Newton was mentioning, I think it was on Thursday of last week. How negative should you be when these charts are all in uptrends? And and the ar argument, or the, the 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 honest truth is, uh, you should not be that negative for sure. Just to finish off very quickly, the charting the second half, I think the breadth condition is key. We'll very quickly just touch on because we talked about this at the end of last week. The S&P has made new all-time closing highs in the last couple of weeks. The S&P advanced decline line has made new highs. The mid-cap index uh, advanced decline line has not. The small and the NYSE one is actually sloping downwards and starting to make new swing lows. You know, the last time that that happened was here. This is that same chart back at February in 2020, right at the market top. And you can see the exact same configuration, higher highs in the S&P advanced decline line, a flat mid cap, lower small cap, lower NYSE. And so the fact that we're showing a, a very similar breadth condition to what we saw at the market top tells me to be skeptical of further upside. Two more charts to go, then we'll wrap the show here. Uh, you know, one is the seasonal trends. If you start the clock after the 2009 low, look from 2010 through 2020, you can see that we are in, uh, you know, July has actually been fairly strong uh, going back to 2009. From there, though, August, September, October, three of the worst months, if you look at the batting average, how often we actually close higher than we opened those months. So I think the next couple months on a seasonal basis, are weak. And so we talk about the fact that the market has not corrected. We talk about the fact that we're now in the seasonally weakest part of the year. And for the S&P in the cyclical bull market phase, absolutely, uh, phase, absolutely the weakest part of the year. I think the chance of a, uh, of a meaningful decline uh, is very real. Just to finish off the chart in the second half, the only non-equity uh, thing I'll show you is really gold. And I, I think the bullish divergence in gold reminds me a lot of the bullish divergence you had in the bond markets a couple months ago before the rally in bonds that did pretty well. It's pretty rare that you have this configuration, lower lows in price, higher lows in RSI. This is after a pullback from the May-June highs. I think the GLD and gold prices could certainly continue to go higher. And I would be eyeing some of those previous uh, resistance levels to see if there's a continued uh, bout of resistance as we approach those levels again. So that is my charting the second half perspective. Again, for me, it starts at the S&P, the seasonal trends, but really the strength of this move, the digestion phase we've been in, and which groups start to really reassert their leadership. We need to wrap the show, go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes. Here we go. We're going to focus a little bit on earnings with the three and three today. We'll start with JP Morgan, which is reporting before the open uh, tomorrow, along with Goldman Sachs. A lot of financials reporting this week, and I think that is a key set of stocks to watch. Uh, the banks uh, overall uh, having a nice bounce today with the financial sector leading just fine. JP Morgan just right at its 50-day moving average. I think this week has the chance to really propel some of these banks to the upside if they get an all clear. And JP Morgan and Goldman are two interesting names to start with on that. If they would start to show some disappointing earnings this quarter though, that could be a catalyst for further downside. And what's great about these charts is they have clear support levels laid out. JP Morgan, it's about 145, 146, which are those recent swing lows. Can it hold above there, which is the most recent time the stock was oversold. Chart number two, Delta Airlines. Not all the airlines reporting this week, but Delta's in on Wednesday the 14th before the open. And overall, this is a group that has struggled. We didn't talk about Dow theory, but industrials have been pretty rough. Transports have been incredibly weak on a relative basis. And I think uh, the ability of, of uh, stocks like Delta to rally is going to have to be driven by a catalyst like earnings. Either it just goes up because everything else is going up, or you have earnings that indicate some sort of signs of life or renewed uh, you know, uh, uh, tailwinds to their, uh, to their business uh, as the stock is testing its 200-day from above. That's a key chart to watch through this week. Finally, Disney, not an earnings name, but a nice bounce today. And it reminds me of early days in the coronavirus uh, uh, period where you had stocks like Disney rallying because of their streaming service. Certainly seems to be what's rallying things today. And I think that's an interesting chart to watch. A stock that's potentially putting in a higher low just above its 200 day and now back above its 50 day moving average. Folks, that is our show for today. Check out all of the charting the second half specials this week and enjoy. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a good night. 
Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.